Member for Oakby Gordon Head. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I rise to speak to uh, Bill 41, Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act No. 3, 2015. Another one of the um, Miscellaneous Statutes Acts, this one with amendments in four different areas. The first, of course, being advanced education amendments that my colleague from Victoria Swan Lake uh, discussed in recently. Part two is children and family development amendments. Part three, energy and mines amendments, with, specifically with respect to BCUC. And part four, justice amendments. And this bill actually, Honourable Speaker, covers a rather large number of bills within these four categories, the Child, Family and Community Service Act, the College and Institute Act, the University Act, the Interjurisdictional Support Orders Act, and the Utilities Commission Act, Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, the amendments clarify a few definitions and generally expand regulatory and exemption powers for the Lieutenant Governing Council or, in the case of the Utilities Commission Act, the minister assigned in the place of the Lieutenant Governing Council. This amendment bill seems to follow a pattern of a rather large number of these bills we've seen this year where the legislation is made somewhat increasingly vague and left up often to the discretion of the appointed minister or regulator. Honourable Speaker, with respect to the Child, Family and Community Service Act, the, this, the amendments uh, are said to enable the expansion of the agreements with Young Adults Program, allowing the Ministry of Children and Family Development to extend the duration of agreements and raise the end age limit. Now, Honourable Speaker, this is important. This is an important piece of legislation that's dealing with the transition of youth from the ages to 18 and 19, who often fall between the cracks as they move from being a child to an adult. And being able to allow, the amendment will allow and enable agreements to be used for life skills programs, in addition to the current educational vocational rehabilitative programs, meaning that children will be able to transition better. Honourable Speaker, I was speaking this last Saturday with an RCMP officer from the Victoria region out in the West Shore who said that the single most common call that they get are calls with respect to adolescent mental health issues. Now, part of the problem, of course, Honourable Speaker, is that these, young adole these adolescents who move into adulthood fall between the cracks after they age out. And this legislation allows ministries to actually coordinate, extend the coverage under the Children and Family Development, and it's a very fine piece of legislation that I'm very proud to support. With, uh, and on, on the same note, Honourable Speaker, the changes to the Inter-Jurisdictional Support Orders Act are another, uh, add further amendments that I'm very pleased to support, and in particular, the changes will allow for child and spousal support decisions from other provinces and territories and countries to be more efficiently processed. The administrative changes, Honourable Speaker, will allow support will order decisions from jurisdictions that do not provide court-certified copies of decisions, such as those reached by tribunal, to be registered with the BC Court. In addition, instead of using the court sheriff services to serve applications for support from other jurisdictions, Honourable Speaker, uh, the uh, Director of Maintenance Enforcement will now be able now use a private process server. Out-of-province support orders are often hard to collect and said to a, a, account for about 11 per cent of family maintenance enforcement program cases. So again, an important piece of legislation within the broader Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act. Then we move to the Utilities Commission Act changes. Now the um, member from Vancouver Kingsway, I believe it was Vancouver Kingsway, um, gave a very eloquent and fine analysis of the BCUC cha Act changes, or the changes to the Utilities Commissions Act, in, in, in particular uh, the, how it affects BCUC. The changes include, um, uh, they're, they're said, they're being told to implement recommendations from the BCUC, or the BC Utilities Commission Core Review Task Force. And that task force, Honourable Speaker, was initiated by government in 2014 in responses to concerns raised by customer groups and utilities about BCUC's capacity to deliver clear and timely decisions. The proposed legislative amendments are said to increase the BCUC's effectiveness and efficiency and reduce the cost of regulation for ratepayers who pay for BCUC in their utility rates. All sounds fine, Honourable Speaker, at face value. But in terms of the implementation, 
what's being proposed, Honorable Speaker, are that the amendments really seem to focus on increasing power and exemption abilities of the minister. Now, while some ratepayer groups consulted during the core review are said to support these changes, it's a disturbing trend that we're seeing more and more often, Honorable Speaker, within this government's uh, legislation to put more and more power in the hands of fewer and fewer and ask British Columbians to trust us. And as we saw earlier today, Honorable Speaker, there are times when trust us simply is not good enough. And the final component of this miscellaneous uh, Statutes Amendment Act is with respect to changes to the College and Institute Act and the University Act. And as I mentioned, my colleague from Vancouver, Swan Lake, did a fine job outlining some of the cons Did I say Vancouver, Swan Lake? With the humble apologies to the member from Vancouver, Victoria Quilchena, the member from, from Vancouver, uh, Victoria Swan Lake outlined some of the issues that some universities, uh, student groups have felt uh, concerned. Now, the, the amendments here, Honourable Speaker, um, to both the University Act and the College and Institute Act make adjustments to how fees are collected uh, or can be connected from students who leave student societies. And the Minister of Advanced Education uh, says he, it will consult with student societies to determine which program or service fees should be protected under legislation. Now, Honourable Speaker, I understand why this legislation was, was brought in uh, with the uh, recent passage of the Societies Act. We were left with a, a rather concerning um, gap in legislation that led to questions as to what would happen uh, to the fees if students pulled out of uh, the student societies. And I recognize that the minister, in consultation with a variety of student groups, put forward the uh, amendments that we see before us today in, in both the, um, uh, on both the order papers as well as in the uh, original act. There has been some concern, Honourable Speaker, um, that um, power, too much powers will, will be granted to the minister to determine what is or is not uh, considered a, a fee. It's something that I would well, rather than pass judgment on at this particular junction, I'll, I'll ask some specific examples during committee stage to get on record a certain number of these examples to see whether or not this is what the minister believes to be uh, considered as student fees or student um, uh, charges. UVic, as the uh, member from Victoria Swan Lake, the UVic Student Society have been quite vocal about their concerns uh, with this specific uh, uh, piece of legislation. Um, they knew, Honourable Speaker, that changes uh, regarding fees levied against them uh, would leave the students who leave the Student Society were coming, and they, they were concerned that uh, they did not expect the format that the government used to bring these changes in to be the one we see today. It's not clear in fairness to the minister who brought in the changes. It's not clear to me in the time frame that the minister had that it was able to, in the, under the same umbrella, bring all potential types and qualif qualifiers as, uh, as and identify all those that would be viewed to be student fees now, and the minister has committed to engaging student groups uh, in the future to discuss this. Nevertheless, it has left a bit an element of uncertainty and when there's uncertainty, there's concern because student groups, not only the University of Victoria and others, believe that they're being asked to trust us once again. Now, I will say, Honourable Speaker, that the, the um, student group at the University of British Columbia uh, seem to be um, more supportive of the, the changes as put in, although they too note uh, the irony of uh, uh, almost a catch-22 being in place that I don't think is fair, but a catch-22 being in place where it says the, they say that the Societies Act seems to imply quite logically that only members of a society can cast votes in society business, yet um, there's an administrative problem because students who resign their membership must continue to pay student fees. The bill specified that these students must also continue to have voting rights, and that seems to be in conflict with the Societies Act. But as I will outline, there are um, ways around this, which brings me to a comment um, that I'm concerned that, in fact, ironically, in light of the amount of time we've spent during this session discussing red tape reduction, it seems to me that one of the uh, consequences of this amendment is a rather substantive increase in red tape to be uh, uh, applied to student organizations in British Columbia. Honorable Speaker, the bill separates the fees that students face into multiple regulation-dependent categories which may operate in different ways. There's a number of issues that I can think of need to be addressed in the committee stage, as I mentioned, that I'll, come first, uh, uh, that I'll cover later. But first, this bill creates 
the so-called red tape for student societies that I alluded to earlier, in as follows. Previously, a simple annual vote took place. Annually, students would vote. And that vote, uh, that vote took place to elect a student board and was used to pass any new funding. The student board would be elected, new funding would be approved or not approved by a referendum, and it would be done with all students who are members of the union, the student union or society, voting. However, the bill appears to morph this process into a far more convoluted red tape process. I should have worn some red tape over my suit here today, honorable speaker, because student societies now, must now account for a new category of students who will cast ballots on funding referendums and not on the student election. So this strikes me as odd, is that you'll have um, various groups of students voting on various things in, spite, in, in light of the fact that student turnout at best of times is not as high as it could be, uh, as uh, they, they already suffer from limited turnout, honorable speaker, in many universities around the province. Uh, let alone making this much more complicated and having different categories of students being able to vote for something or against something. Secondly, Honourable Speaker, the bill con confers, I would argue, unnecessary powers to the Minister to decide which fees apply in which ways. Now, again, I recognise that, that this probably was left as a matter of regulation, in light of the timeliness of trying to get something past this session, so that student, fee uh, student groups collecting fee uh, fees from students who uh, secede from the union or society that represents them would be in place sooner than later. I recognize that. However, there are questions that we can explore in committee stage, and, and they'll fall along these lines. In general, honorable speaker, there's an issue with the increased reliance on regulation to set policy. However, in the case, there should be a simple rem remedy. Consult with student unions about the specific fees they levy and draft the legislation accordingly. Now, again, we are told that the the regulations will come in place through consultation with the student groups. But again, as I've argued earlier and pointed out, some of these student groups, more so than others, feel that they're being asked to trust the government. And depending on the specific student group, <laughs> depending on the, 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 the various student group, some will trust them more than others. And, 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 and the, mem the, the minister, of course, is suggesting that we should all trust government. Well, as I mentioned earlier, trust in government in many cases is simply not good enough. And we don't have to reiterate the, the example we heard today during question period and in the, re the, 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 the uh, resolution I brought forward for an a, a emergency debate on the uh, Shawnigan Lake situation. Um, the, the change, as I mentioned, Honorable Speaker, also appears to allow the government uh, to decide which fees, um, which fees are appropriate. And that, again, could potentially limit the union or society's ability to ch challenge government decisions it doesn't support. Let's suppose, hypothetically, that the university of somewhere in BC decides to form, through referendum, students decide that they want to f put a, a group there, a union, the union, through the fees, have decided that a club's going to be formed. It's going to be the, we have to get the Liberals out in 2017 club. Now, that's a fee that's been approved by referendum, and students then, maybe one or two in the university who don't agree with that, pull out of the student society. The decision as to whether or not that fee, that was elected democratically, whether or not the students who pull out will, 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 can actually take their payment of the fees with them, is left up to the minister, the minister to decide. So, clearly, there is a potential conflict there. There's a potential question as to whether or not the minister will or will not support. And I, 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 I give a rather crass example. But we could actually move a little closer to where it's not so clear. If obviously all of British Columbia has sincere trust in the present minister of advanced education to do absolutely no wrong at any time. But let's suppose, hypothetically, there were a minister who ideologically did not believe that men could be with other men and marry other men. And therefore, that minister, and I'm sure there's many of them in, this, uh, uh, in, in government who feel that way strongly, perhaps they are in the uh, position of decision making. They then could decide that, you know what, these fees are not allowable. And hence, hence, the, hence the concern, 
hence the concern of some student groups over others. Now, as I pointed out, this clearly would not happen in British Columbia with the, the esteemed leadership of the Minister of Advanced Education also representing Valken, Van, Van Kuna, Vancouver Quilchena. But there may be other ministers at some point in the future who will be less trustworthy, Honourable Speaker. Finally, Honourable Speaker, um, I will. <laughs> Finally, Honourable Speaker, I will say that much of this I'm going to try to deal with in, in the committee stage by uh, providing specific examples of specific clubs that do exist already in, in, in some universities and see whether or not the fees to these clubs were the type of fees that the Minister was thinking are allowable to actually be um, you know, passed on as a direct cost back to the students' uh, union if the uh, students uh, pull out of the union or the um, society that, that represented them. With that, I thank you for your time.